open us in prayer. Okay. Okay, everyone, let us open in a word of prayer. Father God, we turn to you for this new opportunity to open ourselves to you, open ourselves to your word, Lord. We believe in your word. We believe that your word has been passed on through generations and that is, it has and it still is, under, has been and it still is under the inspiration of your spirit, Lord. And so we trust in you, Lord, as we gather around your word, your table. We trust in you, Lord, and we ask for your blessing on your word. Enlighten something afresh to us and may it penetrate into our hearts, Lord, as we think of the parable of the sower and the different uh, grounds represented in, uh, the, in the heart of man, the thorny ground, the rocky ground, the shallow ground, and the good soil, Lord. We pray, Lord, that your word would fall on good soil now, Lord, as we as we kind of cultivate ourselves, cultivate our hearts for you, Lord. Because, Lord, we, we need you. We need you, Lord. We know that our spirit is, is uh, willing, but our flesh, Lord, is weak. And, Lord, it operates against us and it tries to drag us down and through tiredness. But, Lord, we turn by faith to you, even though we may be weak. Lord, we thank you that we can say that we are strong. So thank you for this time. In the precious name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone, great to be with you again. Shabbat Shalom. Gina, thanks for hosting us again. I thought Liz and John were going to be with us today, but they're still busy getting settled in their, uh, in their house. But they're doing well and they send their love, their regards. Uh, we're carrying on on the theme of evangelism. And today I want to talk about the authority and the destiny to preach the gospel. The authority and the destiny, our destiny to preach the gospel. And once again, like I said, I think last week or the week before, we think of preaching the gospel as going out on the streets or going door to door knocking and just sharing the basic message of the gospel that Christ died, was buried, rose again. It's more than that. The gospel is more than that. We, we have this term, the good news. OK, that's actually not in the Bible. Good news. It's not in the Bible. The, 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 actually, the word gospel in Hebrew is besora, which uh, it, it means um, like a herald, a proclamation. It's like meat. The word meat. Um, we are proclaimers, we're heralders of news. And like I pointed out, it's not all good. It's not all good. Repent uh, uh, of your sins. That's part of it. Um, uh, escape the coming judgment of God. That's another part of it. Uh, like the Lord said to the Pharisees, unless you repent, you will die in your sins. That's another part of it. But of course, there is good news that we are forgiven. We are reconciled to God. We have eternal life. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Our citizenship is in heaven. There's so much good to that, but it's the whole uh, message. And today we're talking about the authority that we have and our destiny actually to share. And by the way, it's not just to non-believers that we share the gospel. Because like I gave in the first message about the gospel, we all are like a building that has many rooms in our lives. And it's not just about Yeshua being our savior. It's about him being our Lord. And there are many rooms in our lives that he may be savior and he may be Lord, but there may be other rooms that he's not Lord yet. And there's a fight going on because we still want to be the Lord of that room. But he is a gentleman. 
and he is a, a gracious, loving uh, savior. And so it's a partnership of us working out the salvation. But uh, <clears throat> on, the, on the theme of uh, the authority and the destiny to preach the gospel, let me start off by asking this question. Have you in your life ever had the opportunity to name something? I'm sure you have. A pet, a dog, a cat, um, a car, um, uh, a house, um, a, a ministry, you know, um, or a child, a child, okay? Um, think of those moments and think, think of what you went through as you were deliberating what you're going to name that child ministry or whatever it was and uh it's quite sometimes it's quite a quite easy you know you just you want to name it after your grandmother that child or your you know it's that's the tradition of the family or you want to name that ministry after a verse of scripture that's important to you something like that but the process of going what do you go through when you come to when when you go through that process Naming children is, is not so easy, you know? Sometimes people go to, to babies' names books and they look at all the boys and they look at all the girls um, and then they, they, they write down and then they get a list of 10 names and they get less and less and finally, that's how they come to that uh, conclusion. Or maybe the Lord will give you that name, you know? You pray about it. And you feel the, the Holy Spirit has dropped something into your spirit, or you had a dream, or something like that, or you got a verse from the Bible for that ministry. It's quite interesting the process we go through. It's not easy. But why this is important, everyone, because in the days of the Bible, names were not just given randomly. Okay? Names weren't easily given. A name had a lot behind it. A name may identify a certain essential nature of the creature. So that giving that name may be an act of assigning the function that that creature would have. Okay? In, in Mesopotamia, for example, uh, this was referred to as decreeing a destiny over that person or over that piece of land or over that child. You know, many, many, uh, if there was a dynasty like the, uh, the, uh, the ram, the 21 pharaoh uh, dynasties of Egypt, and uh, uh, I think it was the second to last one was called Ramesses. And that name, Ramesses, from two words, Ra, Moses, child of the sun, or meaning God. So it was, it was uh, uh, proclaiming a, or assigning the function of, a, or decreeing a destiny, giving authority to that person or temple or what, whatever it may be. Sometimes conquering kings would get a new name, or they would or they would rename the city that they conquered. By the way, in Jerusalem in the 10th century BC, that's exactly what David did. Because originally it was called Jebus, Yabus in Hebrew, named after the Jebusites, one of the Canaanite confederation peoples. But when he captured the stronghold of Zion, Yabus, Jebus. It says he renamed the city, the city of David. It was named after himself, giving him authority to rule in that city. Sometimes in the Bible, when an event happened, like for example, Abraham offering up Isaac, uh, remember what the angel said, now I know that you fear me, 
and in blessing, I will bless you, and in multiplying, I'll multiply you seed, and, uh, uh, and you will possess the gates of your enemy. And then he looked over, and he saw uh, uh, in the thickets the ram. And it says, there he called the name of the place, uh, Adonai Yir'e, which we say in English, Jehovah Jireh which literally means the Lord will see to it, okay? And so that's a, an example of an event happening and he called the name of the place, something connected to that story. So a part of naming, there needs discernment as well as history or as well as tradition or as well as a custom. Sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, discernment is needed. And there's lots of other cases um, where this happens in the scriptures. When Jabez was born, it says they called him Jabez because he was born in suffering or born in grief. Remember Hannah, when she couldn't have children and she cried and she was weeping. And finally, she, she, uh, she was able to have children and she gave birth to Samuel. And Samuel in Hebrew is Shmuel, which means God has heard. And she said, I'm going to dedicate him to the Lord because God has heard. Or what about Hosea? Remember, Hosea was the prophet that was told to go and marry a whore, a prostitute. And God said to Hosea, love her as the Lord loves the people of Israel who go a whoring after other gods. Now, what was significant was Hosea's name. It's in Hebrew, it's Hoshea, which is the same root word as Yeshua, which means salvation. So Hosea, he was symbolic of salvation, God's messenger of salvation to a people who were committing whoredom. And, uh, and there, there are even some negative uh, cases of this as well. Remember when the Lord said, Simon, you will be called Peter, because on this rock, that's what Petros means, Petra, uh, on this rock, I will build my church. And then the next sentence, the Lord said, I'm I've got to go up to Jerusalem and be crucified. And Peter gets him aside and says, no, Lord. And then the Lord said, get behind me, Satan. And you have become a stumbling block to me. And by giving him that name, that was pretty radical. He was basically saying, Satan is speaking through you. Hasatan, the resistor, the enemy, the uh, the uh, accuser. So um, I think the first good example in the scriptures of naming is something that I've referred to a number of times. It's in Genesis 2.18. And the context is really interesting. This is the story where God had finished his creation saw that everything was good, but then God himself actually saw that something was not good. And it, it says in, in chapter 2, verse 18 of Genesis, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Okay, this is the context where God wants to make a suitable helper for uh, Adam. So what happens? Look what the next verse says in 19. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what, and, and, and let me underscore that. He brought them to the man, Adam, to see what he would name them. And then it says, whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Verse 20. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. 
okay? And by the way, by the way, after Adam gave names to all these animals, then it says that God made a woman from the man, meaning that God wanted Adam to see in the animals whether there was a suit suitable helper for him in the animals and adam realized no there's not and so therefore god he himself took from his side his rib uh and made an isha a woman and interestingly it was only a little bit later that adam called the woman hava in hebrew hava is eve in english and uh, because she became the mother of all the living. Okay, but he named her for a specific reason. But let's go back to naming the animals, everyone. Have you ever sat and wondered how he named the animals? Okay, it's, it's almost humorous. You know, what did he do when he saw a cow, when he saw a monkey, when he saw a pig, when he saw a horse, when he saw a goat? What did he do? And um, there's a couple of different theories on this. Uh, some people say that up until this time, Adam had been so constituted with the tree of life that he instantly looked at each animal and he instantly gave them a name. Okay. The other theory, which I think I lean more towards, although that first theory could well be, uh, you know, very possible. But the second theory is that he actually spent quite a bit of time with each animal and he studied each animal because the names that he gave each animal in the Hebrew, not in the English, but in the Hebrew, um, they match the character of the animal. Let me give you an example. The word pig in Hebrew is the word chazer. And the word chazer has the root word chazor, which means to return, to return. Like the proverb, which says, as a fool returns to it, as a, sorry, as a dog returns to its vomit, and as a fool returns, so no, as a dog returns to its vomit, and as a, sa a sow, which is a male pig, returns to its uh, mud, so a fool returns to his folly. So there's a play on the words, chazer, chazor. Even the, the, the name nachash, which is the name for snake, it, from the word linachesh, to kind of almost be perceptive, to be discerning. Each animal has a deep meaning connected to it in the greek the name uh for a um or actually even in english the name hippopotamus hippo in latin means horse and potamus means i'm sorry uh yeah potamus means water a hippopotamus is a water horse that's all that it means so um there are deep meanings. And so Adam, Adam didn't just randomly come up with silly names. He probably spent time discerning, sensing. And, and I believe on top of that, Adam got, of course, remember, God brought the animals to Adam. So he entrusted Adam with this responsibility, showing us that Adam probably had a natural disposition or, or maybe even a gift maybe even a gift in doing this uh and like i said before adam came to the realization uh that that uh or probably he came to the realization and god saw that there was no suitable helper for adam from among the animals so it's it's really interesting thought why god did it in the first place why didn't god just say okay 
um, I'm going to make a woman from Adam. You know, why did he put Adam through this process? It's quite interesting. Uh, maybe because he wanted to teach Adam something about it. But what we do know is that this was the beginning of Adam's rule and reign and destiny to subdue the earth because God created Adam and Eve and he put over them and said, you shall have dominion, you shall rule, you shall reign, you shall subdue the earth. So this everyone, and this is really coming to the heart of what they're about, by God bringing Adam, the animals, he was entrusting Adam with the responsibility to preach the gospel, to bring, speak words of life into the animals by decreeing and declaring over the animals. And then, like I said later on, who is white, in Genesis 3.20, it says he named her Chava, Eve because she became mother of all the living. So this shows us how powerful, how creative our Adam's words were. The creative power that he had in decreeing and declaring is quite profound. But he probably needed some thought, some discernment, some sense of, studying those animals and definitely being connected to the tree of life. This is crucial. Now, fast forwarding a little bit. If you go to Matthew chapter one, verse 20, we see this also the angels. And remember this in the, in the new Testament, the angels are called ministering angels they had a ministry and one of their ministries let's read what it says in Matthew 1 20 but while Joseph he thought on these things behold the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying Joseph thou son of David fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost and here he goes here goes the angel and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua or Jesus. And the meaning is for he shall save his people from their sins. This was the identity of Yeshua. This is in his name. This was decreed over the Lord. He is our salvation, our Yeshua our Jesus. He is saving. He has saved, and he is saving, and he continues to save us. Because like I said it on our first lesson, salvation is not just an event. It's a process. So we keep trusting in those rooms in our lives that haven't yet been uh, totally consumed by the Lordship, that he will save us from our sins, the things that are stopping him from becoming Lord in those areas of our life. Or think of this week, you know, this week, the Parashat Shavua, the weekly portion, is the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord, or with the man, with an ish. And remember Jacob's name? Yaakov, Jacob, which means a supplanter. Everywhere he went, he was supplanting. And God got him face to face at the Jabbok. And he, he said to Jacob, he said, what is your name, Jacob? He wanted Jacob to know who he was. He wanted him to come to that realization, see himself face to face. And Jacob got it right. He said, my name is Yaakov, Jacob, which is interesting because previously when his father, Isaac, was blind and he said, who is it? And Jacob lied. He was a supplant. He said, I'm Esau. Remember, he deceived his father. 
He was a deceiver. When Esau heard about it, he said, rightly so is his name Yaakov, Jacob. But now God has, has got him face to face. And he's mirroring Jacob, showing him who he is. And, he, and then he said, your name will no longer be Yaakov, but Israel, Yisrael, which has a number of meanings. Uh, you'll be a prince with God. You will walk straight with God. And, and really, that's what happened to Jacob. He, he had a transformation where, he, where God decreed over his life, you are Yisrael, one who walks straight with God. And look what happened straight away, everyone. He, he sent his servants to Esau with, the, with an incredible uh, peace offering. Do you remember all the stock and everything and the livestock? Talk about schmoozing, you know, and it wasn't just a small gift. It was massive. And uh, Esau came to him with 400 men. At first, Jacob thought he was going to die. But then Jacob bows down seven times to him. And when he gives him this gift, he doesn't just give him a gift. He doesn't just give him compensation. He gives him compensation that will procreate itself, meaning Jacob, he could have gone this way, he could have gone that way, but no, he went straight. God brought him to the place in his life where he was no longer a deceiver. He was straight. But this happened because of the decree where God dealt with him, the power of a name that was given. See, can you imagine living all your life with the name Jacob? Can you imagine living all your life Mephibosheth, you remember that guy Mephibosheth, which means from my mouth is shame. Imagine getting that kind of name, or Jabez, you know, because I've caused my mother grief. And and these these name changes are powerful, but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, just like the angel came. And proclaimed over the little baby, you shall call his name Yeshua, salvation. He shall save his people from their sins. And the importance, everyone, of the tree of life and the four rivers that flowed from that tree of life. And uh, as I mentioned earlier with John uh, Hodges, this the day after we uh, last week's session, we went and we found the source of water that that Herod uh, brought into the city through the aqueduct. And when we saw that water, and I actually drank some of that water, the freshness, the 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 purity of it, but uh, from the underground springs. And water is symbolic of life. And uh, friends, when we think of this and, and everything in the light of what I've just said, God has called us. And we, we, were made, we maybe were given names by our parents. Uh, you know your names. Um, and sometimes because of our past, you know, we carry around a little bit of a negative identity. And those negative identities hold us back from really reaching forward. And we've got to know what God calls us. That's the key here. We've got to know what God calls us. What does he label us? What does he decree over us? It's really important. Have we come face to face with the Jacob in each one of us? And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because the, I think it was St. Augustine who said the unexamined life is a life not worth living. Because once we come to that realization, then we come face to face with the Israel, which is in each one of us. Remember I shared the other week when the Lord saw Nathaniel, he said, here is an Israelite 
in whom there is no guile. Okay? And, and to paraphrase that, that's like the Lord saying, here is an Israel in whom there is no Jacob. And I believe that that's what the Lord was hinting at, because that whole story is when uh, Nathaniel, the Lord said to him, from now on, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And that's a reference to the dream that Jacob had. And, uh, and when Nathaniel got that, when, he, when the Lord Jesus said, here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Did you see the reaction of Nathaniel? He said, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Incredible. His spirit was touched. The deep part of, of inside his soul, his spirit was touched. And then, of course, the Lord said, before you were under the fig tree, I knew you. He knows everything about us. But it's not just enough. We need to know what he thinks of us. And I'm not talking about the negative stuff. We could, we could go, go on for years talking about our negative stuff. We've got we to deal with that at the cross. We've got to move on. We've got to move on. If we, we don't know how to move on, we're going to get stuck. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. About remember the word Hebrew means to cross over, ivri la avor to move over. And that's the theme of the book of Hebrews, to move on from the earthly to the heavenly, from the holy place to the holy of holies, from, from infancy to maturity, from the Aaronic priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood, and so on and so on. We've got to move on. And when we move on, we get that sense of who we are and what our calling is. And I believe the more we know who we are, we'll, the more we'll be in touch with our giftings. Every one of us has a gifting, like Adam. Adam, God didn't say to Adam, hey, Adam, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. No, it was, his, it was natural. It was part of his disposition. We all have certain characteristics, certain things we like doing, we enjoy doing, and you could, you know, call them gifts, the things that you specially like doing. And guys like Adam, who named the animals, he was being creative. This is another part of the destiny and the authority given to Adam was to be creative. Notice that it says God brought the animals to him to see what Adam would name them and that's the beauty that god gives us the freedom with our gifting for example if you have a gift of hospitality right and i'm sure most of us do it's such a blessing hosting people think of the creativity that you can use in being hospitable you know depending on who comes over you know what you're gonna cook how you're gonna Set the chairs, the table, who you're going to sit where next to each other, facing each other, how you're going to decorate your house, um, what's the occasion, so much creativity in that. Or think about, uh, here's a good example, every week when I prepare my messages, you know, it's such a challenge preparing messages and, and every week I always feel like it, it, unprepared okay but i do my best you know i put together these you know pretty amateurish uh notes uh and you know i do the best i can as kind of an outline um but that's the creativity of preparing a message and the same with you know a hundred different ways of using our giftings our talents um you know even healing i was thinking of this earlier healing Healing, the, the ministry, not just the physical. Do you know your words can bring deeper healing than sometimes physical healing? You know, you can give a word in season, a word from the scriptures that can change someone's life. I've heard testimonies and it can be the most abstract, the most unthought of thing, a simple you know, hey, you look really nice today. You know, I uh, just want to say 
you know, I appreciate you or whatever. You don't know the power of our words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So we have authority, everyone. We have a destiny. God has called each one of us. But like Adam, we need to stay close to the tree of life. Okay, We all know the danger when we're operating in the tree of knowledge. And let me tell you, I'm not going to go into detail, but this week I was beaten up by someone who was absolutely operating from the tree of knowledge and they said things to me they said things over me and i was like just beaten and it took me a, a day or two to really recover and it was so uh so nasty our uh, words are powerful and uh, but what about when you know the people that that i i would was talking to who helped me work through this, uh, you know, gave me words of life to drive out that darkness. You know, in Isaiah chapter 11, it says, a root or a branch shall come forth out of Jesse. Uh, from his roots, a branch shall bear fruit and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of the counsel of, and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Guys, this is a messianic prophecy about Yeshua, about our Messiah. And it talks about the spirit of the Lord resting upon him. And out of the flow, like the four rivers from Eden, would come wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. And he won't judge just by what he sees or what he hears, but with righteousness he will judge. And with justice, he will make decisions. Guys, we are under the anointed one. Yeshua is our head. He's the anointed one. That's what the word Christ, Mashiach means, anointed one. We remain under his headship. We have the mind of Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians. And we can also operate from that tree of life. And we can get the wisdom. We can get the strategy when we go out and we take the gospel, whether it's to non-believers, whether it's to people in the church, whether it's to people in our home, we have that creative ability in each one of us. And we have that authority, like Yeshua, who said uh, 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 in, in uh, John 5, 19, truly, truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself unless he sees the father doing it. Whatever the father does, the son does also. And the Lord did the most unorthodox things. This is the amazing thing. He, the spirit of God led Yeshua to do the most crazy, what we would consider, what the people of his day considered unorthodox. Healing on the Sabbath. Touching lepers. Right? No wonder he came under such criticism. and false accusation that he was doing things by Beelzebub. He, he spoke publicly with a woman, a Samaritan woman. Talk about unconventional and uncultural. And, and you know, here's the buzz term, politically correct, right? He was not politically correct. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he said. And render to God the things that are God's. And then he engaged in doctrinal conversation. And sometimes it's not black and white when it comes to even doctrine, everyone. Because at times he said, my peace I leave with you. And then on the other hand, he would say, I have not come 
to bring peace, but a sword. You see, the key here, everyone, is knowing when we are operating from the tree of life and when we're operating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because that tree brings death. That's what the Lord said. The day you will die. Let me give you an example. When Paul wrote to the church at Rome, the book of Romans, and then uh, James wrote his epistle, the book of Romans is all about grace. It's all about faith. Whereas the book of James, it's all about faith without works is dead, right? So it's the opposite. Well, just imagine if when uh, Paul and James put their letters in the mailbox and by accident, the mailman delivered those two letters to the wrong addresses. And James's message about faith without works arrived in Rome. And uh, Paul's epistle, which was supposed to go to Rome, handed in the, uh, landed in the hands of the 12 scattered tribes. It would have been a disaster. So there were specific words at specific times for specific people. And this is where we get the wisdom from uh, Isaiah 11. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom. This is where we are. We, and, and I know what I'm preaching. We, we all know this, but it's, it's so important to be reminded of, how, of going back to the basics of our relationship with the Lord. Because, and I've shared this, I've confessed this before. Guys, when I was out on the road as a tour guide for 15 years, busy serving the Lord, I lost that close connection with the Lord. I got so busy serving the Lord that I, I, I stopped ministering to the Lord. And so I, a lot of the time I was operating out of, you know, tradition, out of rote. And, uh, you know, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't ministering out of the overflow. It's so easy to get trapped into this. We got to get that fresh manna, daily bread from the Lord. So, guys, this message, it's 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 liberating message because it shows just like Adam had a gift, he had a talent, he had responsibility. God conferred upon him uh, a, a destiny. Come and name the animals and then subdue the earth, have dominion, rule. What creative power that Adam had. You know, being made in the image of God. And guys, you know, let me finish with one verse in the story. The one verse is from the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 19, where Haggai asks this question. He asks, is the seed still in the barn? Is the seed still in the barn? The book of Haggai was written when the Jewish people came back from exile and the temple was laying in ruins okay and you know instead of building the temple they were building their own houses they were more focused on building their own house so god says to them in chapter one consider your ways go up to the mountain get wood and bring it down and i will take delight and then in chat and then of course god says I'm going to, gold is mine, this is mine. But then he says in chapter 2, verse 19, is the seed still in the barn? Guys, you, if you have the word of God in you, then you have seed. You have precious seed, incorruptible seed, Peter calls it. And you have that living word in you. And uh, God, the Lord told a parable of a sower who went out to sow. You don't know how your life can change someone. And I want to finish with a story of uh, just about that. And it's actually a story about tears, tears and laughter. Because, guys, the, the world out there, either people have got a lot of tears or 
they're, they're, they've run dry of tears. They, they, they can't cry anymore because they're so, uh, so much in pain. It's a true story of the ex-chief rabbi of Israel. His name is Yisrael Lau. And he tells a story when he was a five-year-old boy, he was saved from the, uh, by the American uh, troops led by General Patton. I'm sure you know that name. They came to the concentration camps and um, one of the American soldiers lifted up this five-year-old boy and uh, he started to speak to him. And by the way, this five-year-old boy was petrified, very scared. He lost everything. And uh, the, the, uh, the soldier, the American soldier, asked him in Yiddish, he asked him, how old are you? You know what the boy said back to him? The boy said, I'm older than you are. And the soldier said, he, he laughed, he, he, he smiled, and he said, what do you mean? He said, I'm a, I'm a grown man, I'm a soldier. What do you mean? And, and the soldier actually thought that the little boy had be become mentally disturbed because he said, I'm older than you. And then he said, what do you mean? He said, I'm, with a smile on his face, he said, I'm, I'm a grown man, I'm a soldier. And you know what the little boy said? He said, you're smiling, you're laughing. He said, I'm not. I've forgotten how to smile. I've forgotten how to laugh. And he said, uh, he said, you must be old. Uh, I must be older than you. Because he said, you smile and laugh like a little boy. That young five-year-old boy was liberated and made his his way to France and in France there was a uh, an orphanage 220 Jewish orphans were at this orphanage they'd lost everything and this is three months after they were liberated the head lady at the school comes up one day to the children she said children today at four o'clock there is going to be a ceremony where the mayor of the town, the head of the police, photographers, journalists, all the head of the city will be coming to honor you uh, and to tell your story. Please be on time. So after she gave that announcement, one boy said, we will not be coming. And there was a silence. And he said, we will not be coming because why should we be used in the press, in the newspapers to tell a good story about where were you when the Nazis were destroying my family? Where were you when they were taking our homes? And then he said, some of you even, some of these French people even collaborated with the Nazis. No, we must not go. And the head lady was listening as all the boys agreed. And then she, when everything was silent, she said, listen, she said, I understand. But she said, Firstly, there will be a gift, a present for every one of you. Now, let me tell you, uh, none of these kids had received presents for years. And then she said, on each of your gifts will be your own personal name. Okay. Now, these kids, they'd lost their names. They only had a tattoo with a number. They didn't have a name. They'd lost their identity. And to get promised this present was very tempting. And then she said, please, would you do it for me? So they thought about it. And then the head boy, he said, okay, we will come. We will be there, but we will protest. We will not participate. 
We will not join in the celebrations. And when we go there, we will sit down. We will keep our heads down. We will not make eye contact with anyone. Sure enough, four o'clock came. Everyone arrived. They, the boys were there. They had their heads down. And they had one speaker after another, after another, after another. And then finally, the, the, the uh, host said, before we finish, there's one last speaker that I would like to invite up. And his name was Mr. And I forgot his name. <clears throat> he also is a Holocaust survivor. And he is the man that financially sponsors the orphanage, the 220 boys. Now, when the 220 boys heard about this, and they saw and they heard that he was also a Holocaust survivor. And they thought, you know, he's one of us. They lifted their heads. Now, the man, he was an elderly man. He got up, went to the microphone, everyone. And he just said three words. And the three words were in Yiddish. And it was, I forgot the, the words, but the, the Yiddish word for children is kinder. I think it was kinder, label kinder, or something like that, which translated means the children. Oh, the dear children. That's all he said. And then he started weeping. And he started weeping, and he started weeping, and then he uncontrollably broke down in tears. And he went on for about a minute. Now, all the kids still had their heads down, but they started lifting up their heads, looking at each other. And all the kids had tears also down their cheeks. And then for the next five minutes, everyone, 220 boys uncontrollably just wept and wept and wept. Five minutes of mass weeping. So at the end of the five minutes, the eldest boy, who was 19 at the time, his name happened to be Aharon, Aharon, he got up, he went up to the microphone, and he said, he said, I want to thank you for inviting us today. He said, not because uh, of what happened before. He said, we, we weren't interested. We disagree. But I want to thank you. And he turned to the man, Mr. Whatever. And he said, for the gift of tears, the gift of tears. Because, and then he told a story. He said, he, he said, uh, when I was, uh, sorry, he said, six years ago was the last time I cried. And he said it was when I was watching the Nazis brutally murder my father. And he said, I wouldn't cry. I, I started crying, but then I stopped because I didn't want to give the Nazis the satisfaction of seeing me, seeing a Jew weak crying. And from that time on, I didn't want to cry because to me, it was a symbol of weakness and we are survivors. And so that area of crying and laughter, he said, I haven't laughed, but he said, what happened today? He said, uh, has so deeply impacted me. And then he said this, he said, because the last three months, since I've been liberated, he said, I haven't slept, I haven't slept a full night's sleep. And he said, this is the reason why. He said, because I'm afraid of my future. And the reason why I'm afraid of my future is he said, because I can't cry, because I can't laugh, he said, I'm not a human. I'm not a human being. Who would want to marry me? How could I be a father? How could I ever have children? I'm not a human. But then he said, these tears today have made me feel like I'm a human once again.
And that was the end of the ceremony. It was very, very moving. Now, guys, that's not the end of the story. One last part of that story. 60 years later, 60 years later, one of those little boys, that five-year-old boy who was Israel Lau, he, they, by the way, they all immigrated to Israel. And that five-year-old boy grew up and he became the chief rabbi, the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Israel. And in the 2000, the year 2010 to 2020, uh, uh, actually, sorry, to, from the year 2000 to the year 2010, there were terrible suicide bombings here. It was called the Intifada. And one of his responsibilities as the chief rabbi is when there were people that were blown up or injured, he would go and visit the injured in hospitals and he would go and visit the families and console them. And it didn't matter where they were, from the south to the north, he would visit them. And after such a, a case, he was in a hospital in Tel Aviv and he was in a room ministering to a, uh, a, a survivor, a, uh, a terror, uh, a wounded uh, person in terrorist attack. And after he prayed for him, he went out into the corridor where there were lots of nurses and doctors waiting to shake the chief rabbi's hand. The chief rabbi is a, you know, I'm not going to say he's as big as the Pope, but in Israel, the chief rabbi is a big man. And as he's going through the crowd, shaking hands, he, someone grabs his coat and he turns. And this man, who's an elderly man, he said, Rabbi, he said, it's Aharon. Do you remember me from France? And he named the name of the village. And the chief rabbi, he said, he said, of course I remember you. How could I forget you? And they started to speak to each other in Yiddish. And they spoke for about a half an hour. And as they were talking, the excitement, the energy, the spirit, through that conversation, more and more and more people gathered. And all the doctors and all the nurses were watching them talk, but they didn't know what they were talking about. And finally, Aharon, after the conversation, after they hugged, after they wept, they were weeping. Aaron left. And then the chief rabbi told everyone, there was silence. And he told everyone of what happened and what Aharon did. But one thing, he added to the story about Aaron standing up and talking about the gift of tears. One other thing that Aharon just told the rabbi, he said, he said, uh, when my grandfather, my Zaidi, was when when I was a little boy, he used to take me out for walks and he would teach me Torah, teach me from the Bible, chapters at a time. But he said during the Holocaust, he said he lost his memory, he, he forgot all of it. But he said there was one chapter, one chapter that he didn't forget. And he said every morning when he woke up, when he went through that hell of Treblinka and the, the concentration camp and everything, he said every morning he would wake, wake up and he would quote that verse. And it was that verse that carried him through and gave him hope. And that chapter, everyone, is from Ezekiel chapter 37. And let me just read a few verses. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. And then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. 
So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon were. them and the skin covered them over. But there was, but there was no breath in them. Verse nine. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. And as the chief rabbi was telling all the doctors and the nurses and everyone in the hospital this passage, what Aharon had told them, they were all in, in tears. They were all weeping. And they said, he's just an accountant. He was an accountant at the hospital, this guy Aharon. He'd come from the concentration camp. He'd made Aliyah. He'd survived. He came to the land and he was just a humble accountant. And, uh, but, but guys, think of how the word of God sustained that man through all those dark times and think of how God fulfilled it. But the other thing is, if you look at how the Lord said to Ezekiel, he, he told Ezekiel to speak when it was time to speak. He asked questions of Ezekiel. He told him when to prophesy. And he backed it up by saying, the spirit of God will back up your words. Guys, we have the word of God. We have the spirit of God. May we all keep close to the Lord because out there are people. They're either weeping with tears as we speak or they're dried with tears. They have no more tears. But we have the word of God that can unlock, that can unlock people's lives Never underestimate the creative power that we have in us. I'm not talking about in out the living Lord Yeshua who lives in us, the anointed one. It's not about us. It's about the Lord living in us, but it's also about the transformed us, the new man in Christ. And we all have a special gift. We all have a special talent. May we be like Isaiah when the Lord said to Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, Lord, send me. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for the message this morning, Aaron. I, I enjoy studying the names of God in the name of Jesus. So this is um, enjoyable. Thank you. There, everyone, um, if you have any questions or comments, now's the time. Go ahead. I saw that um, earlier. Uh, there's a mention of another reason to like Patton. So, yep, I agree. <laughs> and then uh, um, beautiful message. So thank you. Um, Anyone, do you have any questions or comments? You can uh, unmute yourself or put it in the chat box. Um, and this, um, actually, I would, I would love more in-depth studies about the names of God and names of Jesus, our own. So we can put that in the possibility bucket for later. All right. Yes. Yeah. That's a good study. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, the um, the stories about the uh, concentration camps and the Holocaust are always very, very heartbreaking and, and sad. Um, but there's so many good, good, 
things that came out of it, people just took it and stayed strong in faith. Um, when we've toured Yad Vashem, the Holocaust yeah. Museum, it's so hard to be there. I remember going there and um, the very first time um, uh, realizing what it was, I couldn't really look at the exhibits because every time I lifted my eyes up to one, I would just break down and say, okay, I've got to, I, it was just so heartbreaking and seeing the, um, the trenches where they had the shoes and the boots from those that were there. Um, so it, it really reminds you of, of the tragedy, but it reminds you yes. of, of the, the good things that came out of it, like the, the lives that you had, um, the ground or the earth, Adama, comes from Adama. Uh, all right, so uh, anybody else have any comments or questions? Go ahead. Uh -huh. okay. hmm. There's somebody speaking there in the background. Oh, okay. Well, well, I do, um, Gina, okay. Audrey, just from what you said about the good coming from the Holocaust. And I thought of Genesis, I think it's 50, I think 20 or something, where Joseph said to his brothers, you know, fear not for am I in the place of God as for you, you thought evil against me, but but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And that to me is can be used in many instances, but I think about it, this where God used it to bring about Israel, and the people back to the land and fulfilling prophecy, really, but, you know, we pray to save many, as it did you, Aaron, which is been a blessing to us mm -hmm. thank you and 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 it's amazing yeah isn't it isn't it amazing with the, with um yeah the the even that story that i told can you imagine being in that hospital corridor and uh, hearing that story i mean they were all those doctors and nurses they were looking you could say like a a, a modern day miracle these two uh, the chief rabbi and Aharon, who had come through all of that, God opened their graves, and of course, it was a hellish, nightmarish experience, and uh, and yet they were seeing the miracle. Yeah, for them, not for everyone, but for them, God, what was meant for evil, that God turned it for good for them, and yeah, there's there's damage along the way. There's damage along the way. Um, there's pain along the way, there's loss, but, um, but we look at the positives, we look at the, 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 the good, the, look at the cup half, half full, not half empty. We're, it's so easy to see a cup half empty. Um, yeah, it's, it's even the state of Israel today, of course, it's a miracle, but there's still a lot of, you know, pain in the past and in the present you know a lot of our soldiers have and are losing their lives defending the country and um you know battling for our survival and of course the story's not over yet but it's um it's uh god is a god who who is always working for our good and even when we're in the dark, we keep persevering, hoping to see the good come out of it. Amen. Yes. Thank you again for that. All right. Well, hey, uh, go ahead. No, just just to comment. Um, this is Jerry and Tracy from Ohio. You know, um, being raised uh, German. Uh, Catholic, uh, you know, I was kind of taught never to cry and show my emotion. I think I've seen my dad cry twice in the 85 years that he was on this earth. Uh, but as a believer, the last 27 years, Tracy says that she's never seen a man cry more than me. So I think there's, there's something about the tears and the tenderness of spending time in the word, being, uh, prick, having the Holy Spirit prick our hearts. God wants us tender and, and soft. There's a combination of being lion and lamb. And I think in our quiet, quiet times, 
uh, I'm always in tears. And, and, you know, if you study the life of anyone that's been an evangelist, Mother Teresa has spent four hours in prayer every day, but had a dark side. And I think that's just being around all the, the, just the hardships and the extreme poverty that she covered in India. So there, there's a combination. I think God wants us uh, soft. He wants, the tears are fine. Uh, the, 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 the weeping prophet of Jeremiah is, is proof of that. So anyway, I, I applaud those men and women that can, that can cry uh, and have a tender heart for the Lord. So anyway, yeah. Thank you very much for that. It's beautiful, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any any final comments or thoughts? Anybody? It's about 20 after now. So um Aaron, if there's nothing else, I guess we can go ahead and close in prayer. Okay. Yep, let's do that. Oh God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you're faithful. We thank you that you are working in us and for us, Lord, and that you've called us. You've given us authority. You've given us a destiny. And Lord, I pray for anyone here, Lord, listening, that if they really don't understand what it means to have a, a, a new name lord i pray that you in a in a in a deep spiritual way that they all the destiny even the names that they have now lord just be speaking to every one of your children sons and daughters lord that they would know the depth of their calling Lord, that you've not just uh, called us out of darkness, but that we are your vessels, Lord. We are your messengers, your servants. And you said freely you've received, freely give. And that's what we want to do, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing by not just becoming our savior, but our Lord. And we all know the cost of that, Lord. We all know the, the pain. Uh, and the, the suffering that is needed to, for us to, to get out of the way so that you can become Lord. And so, Lord, as we take your gospel, as we take the whole counsel of God to wherever you're, you're called us and wherever you're leading us, pray, Lord, that you give us the wisdom that we would keep close and keep feeding on the tree of life, Lord. You said, uh, choose life. And thank you, Yeshua, that you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you so love the world, Father God, that you gave your son. And may we take that love. May we take, as Jerry said, that tender heart. But also, Lord, as warriors, knowing that there's people who, who like to bite the hand that tries to feed them. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us discernment as we, like Adam, as we, like Adam, go and uh, declare names, naming people, sharing your word, Lord. Show us how. Show us how to share your word. Show us how, when, when not to share your word, Lord, so that we can use the gifts that you've given us, the talents, and that we can see people find you, Lord, people that... Um, that need to cry or people that have forgotten how to cry or people that have forgotten how to stop crying, Lord. We want to see lives change, Lord. We want to pray for our families who don't know you, Lord. All those members of our families, we want to bless them with your salvation, Lord. Use us in some way. Give us the boldness. Give us the courage. And Lord, wherever we go, may we be the light, may we be the soul. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters as we bless Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yage Adonai panava lecha v'yichonecha Yisa Adonai panava lecha v'yasim lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. Shem Yeshua, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus our Messiah. Amen.